Salutations, respective viewers. I am George from Ireland. And um, here behind me, you can see uh, Jerome K. Jerome's house, where he lived for most of the middle years of his life. So Jerome K. Jerome was a celebrated author, uh, and um, his books were wildly popular at the end of the 19th century, well into the 20th century. Uh, he's best known for um, Three Men on a Boat, um, which was uh, reprised almost a century later by Rory Bremner, um, what's his name, that one from um, Monty Python, one of their associates, not Eric Idle, one with a Welsh surname. Um, uh, they, they acted out his, uh, his journey, taking a small rowing boat and going up the Thames, um, three men and a boat. Um, and I can't remember the third one, oh my God, it'll come to me. Anyhow, so Jerome K. Jerome, uh, he was born in Walsall, Walsall, no, not Poland, uh, near Birmingham, uh, that, that small town. And um, his father had um, an ironmongery, so making things by hand out of iron was much more common back then. We didn't have, we didn't have so many machines doing it. It's all been mechanized. It's really a, a trade that's died. And they were reasonably well off at first, but his father bought some shares in a local mine, but the uh, mine did badly for some reason. So they, they lived in straitened circumstances. They moved to London, and shortly after they moved to London, they're living in Marlebone, um, his father died. So Jerome K. Jerome was 13, he had three siblings. One of his sisters was named Blandina. She's the only Blandina I've ever heard of. Anyhow, so he was forced to leave, leave school at the age of 15 for financial reasons. Um, compulsory schooling only went up to the age of 12, and indeed most people departed education for good at the age of 12, so he was lucky it went on as long as 15. Um, he thought he would like to go into politics. Um, he had fantasies of being a great writer, but if you didn't have a lot of money or connections, politics, you, you could just forget it. Members of parliament had no, had no salary until 1911. So, although in later life, he doesn't appear to be a, politically, a very political person. Um, didn't attach him to any, any parties and wasn't known for being outspoken on uh, contentious uh, issues of public concern. Anyway, um, he decided he'd uh, try his hand at acting and he was a, a dab actor but just didn't achieve breakthrough. Was part of repertory theatre, these companies where they all, um, uh, they, they rehearse certain plays and there were several plays they could just slip into and out of and travel in the country. So he was an itinerant performer for a while, um, which was uh, an awful lot of fun, but um, not handsomely remunerated. And uh, he scarcely had two brass farthings to rub, to rub together at times. They, they could, uh, couldn't even afford costumes or props on some occasions. So he was going nowhere with that. For a while, he worked for a railway company. Um, he was so poor, he had to collect scrap coal just when a coal would fall off a train. Of course, the, the, the trains were using coal. There were steam trains in this country to the 1950s to bring home, otherwise have no domestic heating. There's a four radiators. Um, try living in a country like this in, in uh, the dead of winter without heating and you would know about it. I've only stayed in one house like that ever. Anyhow, uh, so what was, what was he gonna do next? Um, he, got, he got into writing, he was moderately prosperous. Um, this country had an enormous appetite for newsprint. Uh, it was, the country was moving towards full literacy. Countries such as Germany had already achieved that, having had compulsory schooling for some time prior to the United Kingdom. So um, that was a very important form of entertainment because, of course, there's no radio, uh, no television, um, and you couldn't afford to go to the theatre all the time. So writing all sorts, ghost stories, um, writing advice columns, uh, things like that, uh, humorous pieces. He's best known as a satirist. And then in 1888, he got married to uh, a divorcee and um, a divorce was highly unusual at the time, was regarded as an utter disgrace, a disgrace even if a husband had been committing adultery. I don't know what ground was given. For, for, for a man to commit adultery was regarded as shocking. For a woman to commit adultery was just the end. Anyway, so he bravely defied social convention and married this divorcee who already had a daughter from her previous husband. So they went on to have um, children. But they, uh, their, their honeymoon, they took a boat up the Thames. They couldn't afford very much, but this planted uh, the Germany's mind of his greatest literary work, the, the one that really made his name, name Three Men in a Boat. So uh, it's a fictionalized account of his honeymoon, but in the novel he's with two male friends. 
and they're camping by the river on their way up and down, and there are a number of humorous um, escapades. I, I, I read it 10 years ago, um, but uh, every word is le mot juste, and it's got pace to it. Uh, it's um, limbed absolutely beautifully, and one of the uh, things that really stayed with me about it is this phrase when he's saying, friends worth the name. So don't, you're having a party or whatever, don't invite everyone you've ever met. It's not like Facebook, an arms race, who can have more friends. No, friends who deserve to be called friends. And talking about certain things being lumber, just to throw them away. Out of your life, you don't need them. But they did need their backy, as he said, as in tobacco. It being the um, 1880s, most men smoked like chimneys, over 80% of men smoked, and they hadn't the faintest idea that it was bad for them. Um, there was one doctor who had more than a foggy notion that it was injurious to a person's health at this time, and he counselled his patients to desist from smoking tobacco. He was struck off the medical register because many doctors would advise their patients that smoking was good for you since it opens the lungs. Anyway, so uh, that made him um, a handsome income for that, and he was a celebrity writer. So he, he um, wrote about 40 books, including an autobiography towards the end of his life, um, and then, then he tried to uh, reprise the success of Three Men and a Boat by writing Three Men and a Bummel about a trip round uh, the Netherlands and Germany, um, cycling mainly, in horse-drawn carriages sometime. They're, they're, they're run-ins with various um, German authority figures, calling them Ein Dummer Esel, as in a super donkey. Um, so he enjoyed the Netherlands quite a lot, and it's um, a bit of a harlequinade their uh, journey around uh, the Netherlands and Germany and again not entirely true to life what happened he had to seriously embellish invent a few characters but th that's what the scholars say um, and it influenced British perceptions of the Germans for generations to come but then being overly precise their dogs wagging their tails to a particular rhythm um, being hidebound by rules just inflexibility uh, like an OCDC sort of rigidity when it came to everything um, which uh, is certainly not entirely fair. Um, it wasn't as popular as his first book, so he, he wrote uh, so um, several others. Uh, the first one came along and he wanted to, to serve in the army, the Royal Navy. He was much too old, as well into his 50s back by then. So he did go to France and he, he served in a different capacity. He drove ambulances, he could be fairly near the front, he could still be killed by shell fire or a sniper or something. So he, he was a valiant man. Um, he retired to London and later moved to Northamptonshire. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and he had a stroke towards the end of his life, it, it, and it killed him about about 12 days after after that. He was cremated at Golders Green, and his ashes are interned in Oxfordshire. Again, I, I'm not sure why. Now his sisters are buried there as well. Uh, it could be one of them already died, and they decided to lay him to rest there because he had no particular connection to that Oxfordshire village, so far as I know. So I was always noticing uh, this plaque as I came by here as an adolescent on the bus coming up from Battersea. And then there, it was very close to the Thames. There you can see behind me, maybe not enough con colour contrast, too bright, the twin towers of um, Battersea Power Station, which um, uh, shut down shortly after I was born. That's where the old uh, Chelsea barracks used to be, two big tower blocks from the 60s, just demolished a few years ago. The Qataris are going to own the space of building luxury flats there, on to, to, to Sloan Square. And this huge garden is part of the Chelsea Royal Hospital. It's not a hospital as we'd understand it. Hospital didn't just mean infirmary in the old days, any charitable institution, it's a retirement home for soldiers, sailors and airmen. All right, I think they have to be men, even though women can serve in these roles now. That's enough, I'll switch it off now. Wow. Nice pins over there. All right, toodaloo.